we're all going to be victims of something in life, right? I mean, we all will. Uh, what I realized and what these wise men showed me was to remain a victim is a choice. Are you curious about discovering ways of making your life better? Then welcome to my podcast. I'm Bob Nickman, and this is The Exploding Human. Listen in while I talk with all kinds of people in the fields of personal growth, health and healing, alternative therapies, psychology, spirituality, environment, and the future. I'm looking for those answers that make life better for everyone. You'll meet cutting-edge practitioners, doctors, artists, filmmakers, business people, and those who have overcome challenges. The brave, the curious, anyone who's out there helping us humans to explore, expand, and explode. Hi, welcome to The Exploding Human. I'm Bob Nickman, and that gentleman you just heard is James Swaggart, and we're going to talk about him in a second. First, I want to invite you guys to check out my website, theexplodinghuman.com, T-H-E-E-X-P-L-O-D-I-N-G-H-U-M-A-N.com, and you can uh, check out uh, photos of the guests I've had and synopses of the episode, listen to the episodes, check out uh, a little bio on myself, and um, there's a donate button if you'd like to uh, contribute to the show. Also, if you want to subscribe to my YouTube channel, I would really appreciate that. That is, of course, free. And that is The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman. Add the with Bob Nickman. So much appreciation for all you guys who have been listening to the show. I'm going to talk about my guest today, James Swaggart, and he has written a really terrific book, which I've read. It's called If You Say So. James and I met uh, many years ago in the world of stand-up comedy, of all places, and uh, we've stayed friends for a long time, and this book is not about anything about comedy. Well, there's a little bit in there, but not much. It's really about the uh, childhood that he had uh, with uh, growing up with a lot of trauma, abuse, alcoholism, chaos, violence, all kinds of difficulties and challenges, suicidal thoughts, and how he has transformed himself over the years and talks about in the book and on, on this uh, interview about what we tell ourselves. Some of it's real and based on the past, but choices that we make. In other words, if you say so, then it will become your reality and you can change that reality. And he has spent a lot of years working on himself. He's going to talk about that. And he's also going to talk about some of the things he does now with uh, personal coaching and uh, business coaching and some of the uh, interesting stuff he studied because he, he speaks at uh, schools and businesses all over the place. And one of the things he was talking about was some uh, studies measuring uh, brain activity and how words we use uh, affect the chemical makeup of our brains. Lesson in, here he is, James Swaggart, author of If You Say So. Welcome to my studio, James. Bob, it's great to be here. I have to say to the folks uh, who are listening that uh, James Swaggart and I go way back, and uh, we've been friends for a long time, and he's one of those really special people that's got your back. You're a guy that's got my back. I, uh, and, you know, we've gone through uh, a number of our, our own personal challenges uh, together and apart, but we've always uh, had this uh, nice communication uh, with each other, and I really appreciate your friendship. I have to stay, start with that. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're a special guy, man. You know, and uh, I'm so happy that you're you're sitting across from me here with the headphones on. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good look for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks for having me. And I, you know, ditto. Uh, we're we're mirrors for one another because I could say the same about you. And and uh, I've learned a lot from you. And you've you've been there for me in the clutch. A few times. Yeah, well, I, you know, that's uh, that's nice to hear. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and with all due false humility, I agree. <laughs> and, you know, um, one of the reasons that we wanted to talk today was uh, you wrote this book that I loved. And I want you to tell the folks, you know, first of all, the title and what inspired you to write this book, because this has led to all kinds of other stuff. And I know that it begins in childhood 
And well, let's start there because this this is a, was a really terrific book. You were one of the early readers. I gave you I, a manuscript yeah. early on yes, because I, I value your feedback. Yes, and I had nothing but positive things to say. Probably not, not, I had nothing super specific because I just enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. No, it's uh, the title of the book is If You Say So. Uh, the subtitle is My Story and How I Changed It to Save My Life. And uh, it is essentially a self-help, motivational type of book, but it's very raw and authentic. Uh, you know, I talk about really painful childhood trauma, the abuse, the molest, the incest, abandonment, uh, alcoholism, and dep depression that I struggled with as an adolescent. Yeah. And, and were there any bad things that happened? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. That'll be part two. I, I'm not making light of this, but we're old no, friends. No, so we, 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 you know, we've learned to joke about some of the things that, uh, you know, our pasts have presented. And I have to say, James has worked very hard to, uh, to uh, get past these, uh, these traumas that he's had and, and lead a, a super happy and productive life. So this is where if you're, you're struggling with some, some things in your life, this is a guy that is, uh, you know, I'll say it this way, he's a no bullshit guy. He's going to tell you exactly what happened and how it happened and how he, how he uh, evolved past that. And it, these things do not rule him today. No, and, and uh, with the help of men like you who've, who've kind of shown me the way. You know, I was definitely lost and, and, and uh, definitely searching. And, and, and you know, even in, in, in high school as an adolescent, I was suicidal and had written a suicide note. And just, you know, I was the youngest of 12 kids, you know, started with seven. Then my mom remarried another guy with five kids. They moved in. And it was just, a, it was pandemonium, you know, and everyone was re resorting to drugs and alcohol and abuse and violence. And so as the little guy coming home from school, I would kind of have to, stand at the edge of the driveway and like, do I want to go in there? You know, mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of, oh, here we go. Got to get ready. And, 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 and I think that's why I'm good with people now is early on, I had to walk in the house and I had to identify, you know, uh, 13 people and, and, and say, who do I ally myself with? Who do I stay the hell away from? Who's going to throw a plate at dinner? Who's drunk? Who's high? And, and literally just had to kind of find you know, it was a little bit of like the, the DMZ in there. And, and so I had to find the safe place. And, and um, one of the places that I escaped to was my mind and my imagination. And so I was able to kind of unplug and detach. And, and, and we didn't have a lot of money, but my mom would always give me paper and pencils because early on I showed a proclivity for drawing and sketching. And so that I would get lost into my imagination. And so that's, that's where I would kind of find an escape before I found uh, alcohol and drugs at the age of 12. But but these are all just anything to not not feel and to find try to find that safe place as a, as a little guy. And so anyways, uh, you know, long story short, I wrote this book so I didn't have to keep telling my story because I paid a lot of therapists where I'd go every week and they just like were looping the goddamn story. And it's like enough already. Right. And so it's like what I wanted to do is I met somebody who uh, some amazing man, Bob Palmer, namely, who's like, look, you can you know, he, he said, when you're going through hell, keep going, mm. you know, and, and, and there's a way to find closure in it because we're all going to be victims of something in life. Right. I mean, we all will. Oh, yeah. You know. And so uh, what I realized and what these wise men showed me was to remain a victim is a choice. And I was choosing to remain a victim because we're all going to be victims of something in life. And so what are the stories we start to tell ourselves following those events? And for me, those events as a young child, because I had no other way to cope, the stories I created were I'm broken. I don't matter. I'm unlovable. I'm contaminated. I'm, I was an ex you know, I was a mistake because I'm so far away from my next oldest sibling, they used to jokingly, you know, call me leaky rubber. And that's oh. like, oh, you know, it's like this. That's, that's you know, Okay, funny in the back rooms of a comedy show, but it's like, and I used to say that to people. I used to jokingly say that about myself, right? And there are no mistakes. No one's a mistake. Well, I don't believe they, that anyone's a mistake either. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Those and are so, some pretty powerful messages to get as a kid to carry uh, and, and to realize that they're not, true well i believe they were true that's the thing for so right. long sure. i was certain and 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 what i was doing is i was retelling those stories in fact i would say some of these very things out loud to people 
you know, and, and dysfunctional. I'm a huge dysfunctional family and I have a chronic alcoholism and, but, and I, it's just, and, and this is when I, when I slowly started to realize when I learned about, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz's book, the four agreements, the, the first of the four agreements is be impeccable with your word, only speak in the direction of truth and love and never speak against yourself or others. And when I saw that, I was like, wow, there's something to that. And, and because I, I was able to realize and looking back after I met Bob, Bob's the one that showed me that I was telling myself stories that just weren't true. They were bullshit. And I was, I was, I was basing adult decisions based on misinformation Yeah, that I'm broken, I'm unlovable. But, and I was looping that and, and I would get into these relationships. And if I walk in there telling myself I'm broken and unlovable, if you say so, the universe will give you whatever story you tell it. You know, and so I didn't realize I had a story that was false. And then I did also didn't realize I could create a new story and start to I could write a new story and tell a new story. And that's when things really shifted for me, because I had to <clears throat> this is an, a, a condensed way of saying it. But I had to get flat with the universe and clean up my masses and forgive and ask for forgiveness from those that, 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 that I needed forgiveness from. And that's when I was able to just get kind of flat with the universe and settle my karmic debt so that I could move forward. And, and live free without rem- living, is, is main t- you know, choosing to stay in that victim role. Does that make sense? Well, it makes sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, and, yeah. And, and I'm thinking, like, well, I, I try, sometimes I try to put myself in the place of somebody listening to this show, at, at, you know, at home or in the car. And, and, like, the question I would ask is, how did you do that? How do you, how do you go from uh, someone who was genuinely victimized to... And making and then, you know, of course, you chose for whatever reasons we have to do that, make it part of our story because we didn't really know anything else. How do you go from that to realizing that that doesn't have to be the way it is anymore? I had to do the work and I had to I had to ask for help and I had to listen and realize, first of all, the stories that I was telling myself weren't true. And uh, I was I was I had called my buddy, Kurt, who was it was kind of like you. It was a kind of a mentor to me and and I, I I went to him for wisdom and knowledge and one day I was looping one of my stories again about her or whatever it was and he he said to me he said he said James just sit down get out a piece of paper you got a pen I said yeah I got a pen he said write this down write down every word I say do not believe everything you think mm. and then he hung up on me and I just had to sit there and look at what I had just written. Do not believe everything you think. And that was a moment for me where I went, oh, wow. Maybe I'm wrong about some of these things. That I am lovable because he did, you know, this guy loved me enough to tell me the truth. Sure. You know, and that moment for me was I had to, that was a paradigm shift in looking at how, what I was, what am I focused on? What am I, what are these stories I'm telling myself? And then are they true? Is there any merit to that stuff? And so that was a pivotal moment for me. And I think that, you know, it, 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 you, you make a great point, right? We're here for, the, for your listeners. And it's like, is, is what you're listening to, you know, what are you, what are you telling yourself? Is it true? And, and my belief is, and what I'm, when I'm working with people now, because people come to me and the first thing I, when I start working with a new client that I'm coaching, the first thing I'll say to them is, all right, what's your story? Because mm-hmm. everybody's got one. And some of us have a lot of them. And some of them are even true. That's where it sort of ends and becomes a choice. How do I interpret those facts? Am I the person that's actually responsible for this happening? Um, and if I if I am, how am I how am I willing to change that? Or if I'm not, why am I making it about me when it was actually the other person acting in a certain way because they were sick or troubled or damaged? And that is, you know, as and as a kid, you ha- you you do wind up thinking that when something happens, it's it's got to be you because adults don't make mistakes in children's minds. I don't think they think that. They may have instincts that it feels or something feels wrong or frightening, but they, you know, you don't really have a world view to to know whether uh, any kind type of an incident is is. Um, supposed to happen or not supposed to happen is normal or is healthy. Completely. I, I had heard someone, I heard a woman say to a, a girl that she was mentoring, a young woman she was mentoring, 
once. The, the young lady had said to her, she said, you know, or, or the, the woman said to the young lady, you know, the world doesn't revolve around you. And she said, well, mine does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's hard to argue with yeah, that. Right. <laughs> however, however, uh, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm a follower of Don Miguel Ruiz. I get to go see him. Elizabeth and I are going to go see him in May at this Gathering of the Shaman in Sedona, which I'm really excited. I've never seen, had a personal audience with him, so I'm excited to go see him and his family and, and uh, to hear him talk. But the second of the four agreements is don't take anything personally. You know, and that's a tall order. That's, 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 that's a big one. However, when you read, you know, more into the, the book and how he explains it, that that other things that other uh, things that other people do perceivably to you are just a reflection of that person's journey, that person's trip. You just happen to be the person in the room, you know, and, and, and it took me a long time to put that into practice and to really disassociate myself from other people's stuff, you know, and to really have that kind of healthy line there, you know, because there's, there, there are things I do that provoke responses. That's, that's, that has to do with me and I have to take ownership of that. But there's a lot of things that have happened to me that had nothing to do with me. And, uh, you know, when I was molested as a child, you know, did I have a part in that? Was that, or did I invite that somehow? It's, you know, only a sick person would, 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 would conceive of that. And so, no, I was the kid in the room. Right. You know, could have been it, somebody else. It, it would, it, and it probably was several other people. Well, you know what I mean. And so, uh, because that person was never was never held accountable, um, which is a whole other story I talk about in the book. But, but th- th- you know, the point being is, is is that if you can get your head around this, not taking things personally, and you're living clean, you got to live clean. You know, you got to be flat with the universe. You got to live clean. And when I say live clean, meaning live honestly, do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it. Live with integrity. Uh, be impeccable with your word and the other, you know, the other agreement. The, f- the third of the fourth agreement is don't make assumptions. Always ask questions, get all the information because I've been guilty of making a lot of assumptions about people and situations and I'm almost always wrong. Right. You know. Oh, I know what they're talking about over there. Exactly. He's saying this and the other guy's saying that. And <laughs> Anybody who finishes sentences for people, those people, uh, you know, you're making assumptions. <laughs> and, and it's, you know, the, somebody said there's two, kinds of, there's two kinds of people in the world, people who listen and people who wait to talk, mm. you know, and, and, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of people that make assumptions. We're all guilty of it. And, and so, and the other agreement, the final and most important one to me is always do your best. Always do your best, you know, and that I, I love John Wooden, you know, the former UCLA, uh, the winningest, most, you know, NCAA basketball uh, coach. Uh, who was uh, one of the first big motivational speakers for corporations. And, and you know, he, has his, he always talked about his definition of success, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it's something to the effect of that. Success is the, the peace of mind that comes from the self-satisfaction of knowing that you've done your very best. And because we're always comparing ourselves to others. And that was another thing that Bob would always say. He said, whenever we compare ourselves to another person, we lose. Always. Every time. Every time. Whether you're looking at the homeless guy on the street or the guy in the convertible Rolls Royce, right. whatever, you're, you lose every time. Right. If you're better or worse in your mind, how, how good does either one of those things feel? Yeah. So I try to so I try to avoid the comparison thing and, and I just I just I do me, you know. But that always do your best is really important because some days you might be fighting a, a cold and you're at work anyway, slugging it out and you're like, I'm at sixty percent but that's your best that day. And that's okay, and that's good enough. Some days you just make a decision to half-ass the day, but that's you can do that perfectly too. <laughs> exactly, and that but that's, that Without, that can be a your guilt-free best for the day. half-ass day is not a bad thing once in a while. <laughs> exactly, and that's the, nobody's one hundred percent all the time, right? Uh, not me. No, nobody is. I learned to change my story, and I learned I could create a new story. So my new story was: I'm going to go to Hollywood. I don't know any. I don't know a soul there. And I'm going to go and I'm going to go make something because I'm a creative soul and a creative uh, mind. And so that's where creative people who didn't graduate because I had to drop out of college. I couldn't afford to finish. So I packed up and moved to L.A. without knowing a soul. And I brought scripts that I had written. And I was on stage doing comedy at the improv and the comedy store. And I was, you know, have great friends who've gone on to be incredibly successful in that. But I, I slowly got to realize that what I wanted changed. I realized I was I was better behind the camera and I became a producer and very successful at that. And so I've built, run and sold several multi-million dollar award-winning production companies. I'm currently CEO of a, 
of a very successful production company. So I'm doing that full time in addition to podcasts and radio shows and motivational speaking and coaching. And, and uh, uh, I've got a beautiful fiance. My life is full. And I, I, you know, I went from being homeless at one point, living in a green nylon sleeping bag in McKinley Park in downtown Sacramento. And now I live, and my address is 90210. I live, in, <laughs> I live in Beverly Hills, you know? And it's like, what, like, that's, that's a pretty amazing journey, you know? And so now what I want to do is I want to help, help people change their stories. And I do it, I mean, it's not all about, for me, getting paid either, you know? I have a one-for-one one program on my website. You can go to jamesswigert.com. But for every paid speaking engagement that I do, I offer a pro bono, non-paid, free speaking engagement to inner city schools, underfunded programs. So if any of your listeners have anybody who's leading an organization that needs some motivational speakers to come into high schools, I, I, I come in and talk about suicide, depression, and alcoholism in schools, of how I was able, able to overcome that. I'm currently working with a big corporation. I get flown up to Apple. I speak at Apple at the major headquarters there in Cupertino. And, and it's about using this power of the spoken word and if you say so, to, to correct your course, not only personally on an intimate level, but professionally as well. Because, you know, how many times, I mean, you'll be in a situation like, they're going to figure me out. I'm in a really important meeting right now, but they're going to figure me out. Yeah. You they're going to realize they're not getting much. I don't, be <laughs> I don't belong here. Yeah. I think, I'm a phony. Don't you think most people feel that way some, some, in some place inside of them? Some, if you it, say so. You know, I really think most people do. I mean, even when I feel competent, there's a little part sometimes that goes, ah, you know, I'm not, I don't really belong here. <laughs> you that, have that a lot. You, and, and, and I will say this, and I love you, and you know that. You have that a lot, and whether it's the, the I neurological, have what, I have what a lot, the neurological. Wait the, a minute. The, the, Wait the, a minute. The, <laughs> whether it's the neurotic Jew of yesteryear yeah. or what, but you have a lot of that of that of that the self doubt, that little voice that comes in. Ah, yeah, I'm not part. Of that. That's for them, not for me. And and the thing is, is that the, yes, the, I do. I have some of that very uh, exactly earnestly that. And then I also have false humility <laughs> where I'm pretending that yes. I think that yes. when I'm actually probably not. Yes. I've, yes. It's a little bit of both. Because you know who you are. I know you. You know who you are. Yeah, most of the time. You do. Yeah. You do. More than most people. Let's just go with it. If we're going to compare ourselves to others. So. <laughs> exactly. But, but I know you. Yeah. And, and, and this is where I'm going with it. This, okay. is, this is actually a, a really... I got defensive, which on, I love, no, that I had a little emotional reaction here. But, Go ahead. But, but no, it's, it's because you're a beautiful man. And the thing is, is, here's the deal. You know me better than I know me, Bob. Would you agree? I mean, you do. Mm. You've seen me behave in the world for a couple of decades now, at least. Well, I... I We've shared I have a perception of who, who, who you are most right. of the time. But I'm not with you in your private moments when you're chasing squirrels with a weed whacker. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that side. Okay, of you. <laughs> okay. Let me let me say, let me say this: your your children, your daughters, you know your daughters sometimes better than they know. Yeah, them. that's absolutely okay. true. So yes. so let me use a better example. Okay. Uh, and that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about because yes, we all have insecurities. I'm not here to say we don't. Right? We're imperfectly human. But what are we doing with that stuff when it comes up? What are we doing with that? And that's why that first of that's why this I wrote this book of like, if you say so there right down the street here on one of the walls, there's a there's a beautiful mural of Abraham Lincoln. And the quote from Abraham Lincoln on that wall says, folks are just about as happy as they make up their minds to be. Yes, that's what this whole thing is about. All right. So the idea of if you say so, then it will become your reality. If you're going to say to yourself a negative attitude or a negative belief, that will become true. If you're going to say the opposite, then that will become true. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know those people who are the Debbie Downers and they're always like, we're never going to make it and the cell phone screen's always shattered and they're late <laughs> to work and they're a mess. You know yeah. those people. Yeah. And they never make it. We're never going to make it. Conversely, when we speak in the direction of truth and love and, and we're saying positive things about ourselves, we can change the story. So there are studies, ongoing studies at UCLA and Harvard, where they are uh, uh, scanning the brain, for so measuring brain activity, when words are spoken to the patient. Mm -hmm. And 
I did. A, I recently spoke at the Keck School of Medicine uh, at USC for you know young up and coming doctors, and I'm I'm like I'm speaking to some smart kids here. I better go brush up on my stuff, and that's where I, I uncovered these studies that are being done and have been done, and and when they're measuring brain activity, and they say words like no, stop, the amygdala, which is our fight or flight reptile brain that's been there since dinosaur days, right? That starts to flood the brain with essentially anxiety, negative energy, negative hormones and genes. And then when they actually flip the script and they start to say words like peace, love, harmony, then the energy completely shifts to the frontal lobes, where, which is the center of reason and logic and emotion. And all of a sudden, it floods the brain with endorphins and dopamine and all these other goodies that, 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 that are positive reinforcing. And so you actually, by the words we use towards others and towards ourselves, physically affect the chemical makeup of our brains. That's, that's amazing to think about. And so, uh, you know, how many th times have we worried about things that actually never happened? Well, 90% of the things I worry about don't happen. Sure. Or so, they don't happen the way I think they're going to happen. Right, right, right. So I'm going to err on the side of maybe this shit could work out. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like I, all of a sudden when I started, and this is, and, and here's an example of how we can, and I, and I was actually recently speaking to um, 4,000 young creative professionals in Manila in the Philippines. And I got up and I, I had to explain to them, you literally can change your now with the power of the spoken word. And I got all 4,000 of them to stand up and I said, close your eyes, think of something you're grateful for. And so I'll ask you to do the same. Think of something you're really grateful for right now. You just hold that right there. And you, okay. Something you're grateful for. And I said, all right, now stand up and here we go. And I had everybody yell at the top of their lungs, I am so grateful and I love my life. Mm -hmm. And we yelled it to the top of our lungs. And I, I had them repeat after me and we did it top volume. And all of a sudden you heard giggles afterwards and people are laughing and, 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 the, and, and you could feel the energy change in the room. And I said, could you feel the energy change in you? They all raised their hands. And then I said, how many of you didn't go along with me because you thought you'd look stupid? Oh, yeah. 27, 28, 29, 30, 50 hands were raised. And people were just like, so again, that's a story. That's a story that we're telling ourselves. And it blocked them from experiencing that great energy of like, wow, I can change my now. I'll do that when I'm driving. People must look over at me and think I'm crazy because I'll just be like, I love my life. And I'll yell it to the top of my lungs. And it, it just changes the energy in us. Yeah, I was just thinking when you said that, how many times in my life, especially when I was younger, that I held back from doing things because I was afraid to look stupid or I'd be laughed at humiliated in some way I don't know where that came from at what age it started but I remember thinking I am gonna be one of those people <clears throat> that's never gonna allow other people to hurt me sure laugh at me interesting that I became a comedian <laughs> but uh, um, but they I was controlling them laughing at me that's why I think that was such a you know uh, other than I also love it but, it, you know, there there was a, a probably one of my biggest fears that I that I discovered. I told myself a story that the worst feeling in the world was to be laughed at in a humiliating way that and I would do anything not to have that happen. And if it included not participating to save myself, that's what I would do uh, to be exuberant, to be joyful those were all vulnerable positions in my in my mind um, and when I'd see other people do it I was a little bit jealous and a little bit baffled <laughs> and I'm, I'm I'm getting down to one of my core sort of uh, blocks that I've had over my life I don't feel like I have as nearly as much of it now it's actually kind of a rare thing for me to to feel that uh, but the thing that you said earlier, which was the key for me to be okay, to be, I guess, vulnerable is the word, um, was you were, you were talking about um, connecting what you know in your head with your heart. And that's where I had a disconnect. You know, I had a lot of shit figured out in my head, but it was not connected to the heart out of fear. 
Sure. Well, you know, we use, you know, we know the comedians aren't the healthiest of folk. I'm still waiting for them to find a <laughs> bunch of kids taped up in Jerry Seinfeld's basement. But, yeah, the, the, I mean, here's the thing is, is comedy for m- most comics who I've met and known who've been honest with me. Comedy's a moat. It's the water around the castle to keep you at a safe distance so you can't hurt me. Okay, I'll go with that. Water is a, uh, you know, humor or comedy is a moat for us. And it can also be a weapon. A shield and a weapon. Absolutely. It's all those things. And it's also, you know, like, well, I was, uh, I don't know if I've ever talked about this in the podcast, but I I, uh, had a, and you know, (laughs) you know me, so I had a very uh, strong relationship with sarcasm. Uh, And I remember saying, uh, well, you know, I kind of need it. I'm a comedian. It's, you know, it's my income. And I had heard somewhere, some some guy gave a talk and he was saying, well, you know, I always thought, I go, yeah, sarcasm is a little mean, but it's really, really funny. And he goes, the truth is, it's a lot mean and only a little funny (laughs) and only to you (laughs) when you're doing it. (laughs) And I started to see people that were close to me they were a little guarded because I would do it even to my closest friends. I'd be sarcastic, and I had to look at what is that. You know, it was protection. It was a armor. It was a weapon. It was all those things that uh, came. It came to a point where it didn't serve me, and it actually. I was feeling like, oh man, I've actually wounded people I care about to control them and manipulate them to keep myself safe and. I, you know, one, I don't need to do it anymore. And two, it's actually having the opposite effect of what I want, which is I'm, now I'm pushing people that I care about away. I uh, completely relate because when I was doing stand up, I always liked the guys that, that, like when Richard Pryor would go after somebody and he's heckling, you know, somebody's heckling him and he'd go after him. I loved that. Because being the youngest of, you know, there were, I had nine older brothers. It's like, so shit trickles downhill, you know? And so, they might be able to kick my butt, but I'm going to be <laughs> insulting the shit out of them while they kick my ass. And so uh, I became very acerbic and uh, with my tongue, you know, and could just be vile and 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 mean. And you know, I was we were there were mad magazines laying around growing up. So I was raised on oh, sarcasm, <laughs> cynicism, and just you know smart assism. And and so I got really good at that. And and it's it's basically it's take two steps back comedy, back up. Mm-hmm. You back up. You're too close. Back up, you know. And it's like, and, and when you're firing those shots, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's a lonely, it's a lonely place to come from. And that's, you know, and and and, but the, the the thing for me is that meanness. And and it's like, yes, it can be funny, but who's your audience for that? Other mm-hmm. people who are suffering, who try to do the same, right? And so. I think, and I think this happens, I usually seem, I've seen this happen for a lot of comics. They kind of get well, they get into therapy and they start to work out some of the issues and, and their stuff's not as funny because they're not, as, not in as much pain anymore. And also the, the need to have strangers, uh, this is my own case, the need to have strangers like me kind of went away after a while. Sure. <laughs> and uh, that, that's not really why I stopped. I, I really stopped because I didn't want to stay up late. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's like, a, yeah, I'm kind of tired of living at night. <laughs> this is, and I got tired of driving you. Bob, that's right. Oh, right. Well, yes, that that is another issue. Thank you for driving me. No, no, I, no, I can't. Good. I don't. Uh, I can't. I can't drive at night. Those I, are fond memories. Yeah. Well, we're, we went to carpooling work. to comedy. Yeah, and the the way up was just as much fun, if not more, than the actual work. Well, you usually slept on my shoulder on the way back. But. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> he's, he's kidding. I think. Uh, no. I'm did I joking. did I fall asleep? Right? No. Uh, only when you drive. So <laughs> if I drive, we don't get home. <laughs> That's just, we just don't make it. No, the hu- I'm glad you brought up the humor part because I literally, the last line of my book is what Bob Palmer used to say to me every time we parted ways, no matter how heavy the conversation got and, and whatever, he might've been calling me out on some stuff that was really uncomfortable for me to hear or whatever. But whenever we'd be parting ways, he would always look back and he'd go, Hey, and I'd turn around and he'd go, and find something to laugh about. Oh, wow! What a sweetheart. And he would always say that because we, I, you know, you knew you you knew Bob, and he lo- loved that guy. He appreciated levity, and and you know he'd he'd worked with Dick Van Dyke as his manager for like fifteen or fifty years or something like that. And so Bob loved the humor, loved a good joke, and and so levity is a big part of this, right? It's just don't you know, 
don't take yourself too seriously, right? Mm-hmm. And and so the the humor, but what what's the, where's it coming from, right? And who's the victim of your humor? And so yeah. what I try to do is I've I found myself uh, I kind of less uh, amused by insult comedy, and 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 kind of more intrigued by cerebral comics and people who are really just kind of finding funny without there being a victim. <laughs> you know? And and I respect that kind of comedy more now. So you're doing some uh, uh, motivational speaking because you mentioned that. Yes. That uh, people can find you on, yes. your, on your website, which is, what is it again? JamesSwigert.com. Okay, S-W-E-I-G-E-R-T. So yes. That's a, it's not like the the uh, evangelist. It's spelled no, differently. He's, he puts A's and two Yeah, G's you don't need an A. No, you know. S-W-E-I-G-E-R-T. Correct. JamesSwigert.com. If you want to find James Swigert, that's the best way to find him. Or you can call me, but I'm not giving out my number. <laughs> <laughs> no, shoot me an email. I, I, I love helping people. And uh, you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram. I'm constantly posting quotes from the book and people's nice uh, uh, critiques of the book. And the, But the, the, the feedback's been overwhelmingly positive. I'm getting like five out of five stars on Amazon. And, and, and I'm just getting really, really great uh, feedback. I just had this one independent review come in and, and, and they essentially summed it up. They said, wow, I really enjoyed this book. I was surprised. And they said he uses some raw language in it, but it was carefully appointed. In, 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 and, and, and they said, yeah, I just couldn't find anything wrong with this book. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. Love that. And that's somebody you don't know, which is and even somebody better. I don't know. Yeah, even even gooder. <laughs> give me another story from the book. Uh, not me, because yeah. I've read it. But look, give the yeah. audience a story because we want to whet their appetite. Yeah, sure. For picking up the book and finding out more about who James is. Yeah, and, or, well, or the, was the, and the, is becoming. One one of the uh, reasons why I started to write the book was I was I worked in, in, on the east side of downtown Los Angeles in like tent city and homeless people everywhere. And I was driving home one day and just feeling really sad about this. You know whatever, 30 to 80,000 homeless people on the streets of Los Angeles County. And I was, I was like, I don't know how to fix that. But maybe I could go find the guy to, to doing what I do best, which is help crack people open to go be amazing. How, how can I go find that person who's that next uh, uh, community activist that might be saying to themselves, well, they're not going to let me do that because I'm a girl or because I'm a whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. They got some story. And so what I want to do is I want to crack open stories for people so that they can go be amazing. Because if you think about it, where would we be if 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 Barack Obama said they won't, you know, hey, they're never going to let a black man be president. If you say so, Mm -hmm. you know, and he didn't listen to that story that I know I work with a lot of young black men and and they have that story. And it's like it's like it's like if you say so, like I'm not going to convert you and I'm not here to convince you. But you do have a choice. And where would we be if Oprah Winfrey would have said, you know, hey, they're not going to let a black woman run a TV studio in Chicago. They're not going to let a black woman be a billionaire. You know, she just didn't listen to the stories. And so what I believe is that we all have the chance to go be amazing, whatever that is. It doesn't necessarily mean to be famous. I'm just using very high profile individuals. It might mean going and being the most incredible 12th grade teacher in Pocatello, Idaho. But you're that kind of teacher that you take the time to see your pupils and to see your students for who they are and to nurture their creativity, to nurture their strengths. You're the kind of teacher that people come back 10, 15, 20 years later to say thank you. Thank you for seeing me, for seeing who I was, and for nurturing my creativity or, or whatever it is. You know what, what I mean? What was your teacher's name that did that for you? There was a teacher named uh, uh, Mr. Jerry All in high school, and I was a I, so I had gone to a college prep school that all my older brothers had gone to, and they all became doctors and lawyers. And I was the creative kid. I was an artist. They didn't know what to do with me. And I didn't fit in because there was calculus and algebra, and I, I, mean, I, I was okay at geometry, but I wasn't good at science and math, and I struggled with those subjects, and I was a D-minus student. And, uh, but because I was always painting and drawing, they saw that I had potential. And so this one teacher, he took the time, and we were supposed to write a paper like pros, cons, and then what's the solution on, a, on any given subject. And so we didn't have art classes at my school because it was a college prep school. Um, I was critical of that, and I wrote this paper saying here are the pros, here are the cons, and there was no reason why they should not have had art classes in that school. And I said, and I think that I had offered up my solution was maybe I'll come back here and implement an art program and maybe teach it myself. And uh, it was the only paper I ever got an A on in four years of barely skimming through high school. 
And this man took the time to talk to me and to coach that argument out of myself. And, and when I felt that it was a one-sided argument, because there weren't a lot of cons, you know, mainly budget, right? For, but, mm-hmm. but there weren't a lot of cons for not having an art class in a high school. And, and I thought it was too lopsided and they weren't going to, he wasn't going to accept my, my position on this, but he was right hundred percent behind me. And he stood behind, he goes, you're right. He goes, you're right. This is a great, this is a great platform for you. And he encouraged me. And I, and I, I, I so I got passionate about it, right? I was out of my head and now into my heart for something mm-hmm. I felt something about, right? I, I think he's at a school. I've tried to find him. I think he's at a school in St. Louis somewhere. So if you're listening, Jerry, thank you. And, uh, hit me up, uh, jamesswiger.com. Uh, <laughs> My whole thing is like, go find your passion, find your soul's desire. And in that journey from our head to our heart, I use the, the metaphor. It's an extended metaphor in the book of the train, right? That, that everyone in life gets this steam engine locomotive and a coal car and a bar car and a baggage car and a dining car and a passenger car and a caboose. The full thing. We got it. Those tracks that we're on, that's our, that's our lives, right? That's fate, destiny, whatever you want to call it. The tracks are laid out for thousands of miles in front of us. But oftentimes when I encounter people who are struggling, they've just been sitting in the bar car <laughs> where I spent way too much yeah. time, you know, uh, or they're in the baggage car. Just, I'm going to therapy. I'm just, uh, yeah. or they're on the caboose looking back, could have, should have, and would have, right? Ref- what could have been. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's all fine. There's a time and a place for each one of those cars, right? Right now we're in the passenger car where I'm here with my buddy Bob. But really, if we're going to go anywhere or do anything in this life, which is what I believe the universe wants for us, is to go flourish and be amazing, not just to live small and meek. That was something that the kings had commanded. (laughs) Live small and give me the money, right? That's not what it's about. It's about go and be amazing, whatever that means for you. Go to the baggage car. Get rid of some of the baggage we don't need. You know, um, that's getting flat with the universe. There's, there's a longer conversation about how we do that. you got to get up there. you got to find that furnace is the... is, is kind of s- symbolic for our soul's desire, that passion, that fire that burns inside of us. And, and sometimes when I'm encountering people, the fire's out, right? There's a smoldering whisper of smoke. And so it's about picking up the shovel and getting bloody knuckles and starting to shovel that coal and throwing it into that furnace to get that train going so you can get that train moving. And shovel, it's about shoveling coal, which is the work that we do day in and day out to take care of ourselves from the basics, diet, exercise, prayer, meditation, gratitude, visualization, service to others. That's the shoveling of the coal. That fire inside of us, for some of us, it's just we've never nurtured it. We've never even discovered it. And so my thing is, is like, let's find out what that is for you. Even when I'm working with corporations, I have them sign an agreement to say, my allegiance is to the individual. Because if you're trying to cram a square peg in a round hole, you're not going to benefit from it as a company. And, and sometimes you need to, you know, people need to discover what they're really here to do. Has anyone what turned about. you down because of that? No. And, and, and this is what I do is a lot of the times managers, because management is the hardest part of, of, of business and, and any entrepreneur will tell you that. And so what I do is I try to come in and bring in some of this kind of wisdom and, and people thinking to, uh, uh, and kind of practical, pragmatic tools and solutions to try to help sort through some of this. Because a lot of the times people, and I've been guilty of it, I've tried to cram a square peg in a round hole where I had this guy who was an executive producer that worked for me at this production company. And I struggled with, I said, I need you to be out and taking care of clients out and entertaining and get out there, you know, promote the company. And he wasn't that guy. And, uh, I had him take the Myers-Briggs test, actually, and I found out what his actual personality profile was, and it was incredibly revealing. His whole thing is about managing down his team below him and taking care of them and making sure they were happy and well cared for and had a good quality of life. That was his jam. Taking care of your people is everything, right? Mm-hmm. If, you're, if, you're, if you're people, I mean, this is one thing I teach companies, too, is it's, it's, I, I'm not a financial planner. I don't get in there with the metrics with the CFO because there's people that do that, and, and, and I let them do that. But for me, I'm like, I come in and I, and I explain morale affects the bottom line, and if your people aren't happy, it's affecting the bottom line. It's, uh, morale is not, a, is not a line on the spreadsheet, but it does affect the bottom line. And so what I do is I come in and whenever there's friction or there's, there's discord, I can come in and I get in for, I do discovery meetings for all the parties involved. And then I ha- just help people communicate, right? I'm like a therapist, like a corporate therapist almost. How much is fear the factor that, that really is ruling on this? Because there's money. 
100%. Mm-hmm. And yeah. when there's money and yeah. livelihood, there's, you know, there's inevitably going to be a certain amount of fear. Yeah. Because if you have a company that runs on that, which some do, that's a, that's a management style <laughs> that, that some companies have. And they Completely. go, let's keep yeah. everybody scared. So they're going to do what those we companies want. don't hire me. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I could survive in a place like that. Yeah. You but know? It's, I mean, it's that's just, just it's, that's that's the antithesis of my philosophy. You know, is, is, is really, it's about people. I, I'm a big fan of Sir Richard Branson's management style because his whole thing, why he's been able to diversify and be so successful and own his own island and, and, and live the way he does is, is he just takes supreme care of his people. When I think about the various jobs that I've had over, you know, four decades or whatever, how many have I really enjoyed and why did I really enjoy them? And it's when I felt the way that you're talking about where I felt appreciated and I was having a good time and I was able to be uh, creative and productive and all that kind of stuff without looking over my shoulder or having to deal with, um, you know, a lack of communication and, and basically fear, yeah. you know, fearful atmospheres to me are like, I run, I can't, I yeah. can't be in them. In, in creative environments, fear is the enemy of creativity. Yeah. And you know, what's wrong with mistakes <laughs> along the way? I mean, that's part no, of it. No, that's, that, that's I part mean, of the. That's why there's an eraser on a pencil. Good point. That's your next book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just gave you a title. And all, I want to let this resonate with your, with your uh, listeners here. Is nobody, nobody's harder on me than I am. I can really be tough on myself. And I used to do that all the time. I would call Bob Palmer, my mentor, and just be flogging myself once again about, I should have known, could have, should have, would have, something like that. And he finally just said to me after he listened to me for a minute, he just said, be on your own side, kid. Mm. Be on your own side, kid. And this whole thing is really about, you have a choice to love yourself. Like you have, you have it, you have a choice. I was sitting in uh, a therapist's office a number of years ago. I said, what's the simplest, I asked him, what's the simplest version of, people uh, being okay and he said well if I would tell somebody if they couldn't afford therapy at all and they didn't and couldn't go and didn't read and uh, were in no sort of self-help program any of that he goes the one thing I would say to them is be kind to yourself beautiful you know and then I had heard that the uh, Dalai Lama says that um Kindness is his religion. So Beautiful. I decided to make that my religion, although I'm not practicing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to get to that joke. I'm sorry. But I, but I think that really is it. K- kindness to yourself and then in, and to other people. Uh, wow. What a different world. The universe will give you whatever story you tell it. And, and going back to the kind of the business side of things, it's that book that's got the worst title ever. Uh, by Dale Carnegie was how to win friends and influence people, which sounded to me like how to conquer people and squish them and make them do what you want. But when you get into the book, it's fascinating because his whole philosophy is people just want to be respected and be heard. That's the whole core of that. And, and, and what he did was he used that title to bait all the narcissistic fools in Wall Street to read his book to be nicer. Right, and then he takes a left turn and goes on a spiritual path with, yeah. with uh, business. I have, right. I have a guy I know who owns an auto body shop in Ohio, and he does really well. And he was telling this friend of mine, he goes, man, because I'm doing so well. He goes, I, you know, I, I do really good work, and I charge a fair price, and I do what I say I'm going to do. He goes, who knew that that was a formula for success? <laughs> I mean, he's kidding. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's being funny about it. But, but no, that's 100%. And I put that in the book. I said, somebody asked me, they said, what, is the, what do you think is the key ingredient? If you had to pick one single, single thing to your success, what's the key? And I said, doing what I say I'm going to do when I say I'm going to do it. Because that separates me from 95% it, of the people out there. Isn't that Believe amazing? It not, yeah, it's amazing. And showing up with your pants on is a big bonus, too. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, a lack of pants can really hurt a guy <laughs> in a business you gotta environment. Know, you got to know your name and have pants on. Although, yeah, and pants, <laughs> by the way, one of the funniest words <laughs> there is, that and cheese, those two words. If you mix them yogurt, together. <laughs> yogurt. 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 Yogurt's pretty funny. Uh, 
but that is true. Most people do not have follow through. I don't know why, but it, you know, when you think about, let's say you uh, you called uh, a plumber to come and fix, you know, your broken sink. If the guy didn't show up, or he didn't show up when he said he was going to show up, or if, you know, would you use that person again? You know, you'd move on. But if a guy who maybe has, oh, you know, he might not even be as good of a plumber, whatever that means, you know, but he shows up every time and he does good work and he's and he's pleasant to be around. That's the guy I'm going to call. It's it's integrity, right? Something that seems to be coming. The Museum of Integrity. Yeah. <laughs> Integrity is hip, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> We're bringing it back. Integrity is the new sleazy. How about that? <laughs> so uh, the book again, let's talk about it because it's on Amazon. The book is If You Say So, if My you, Story and How I Changed It to Save My Life. Worth reading, by the way, uh, for whatever kind of struggles that you may be going through and think, oh, I'm never going to be this. I'm never going to get to this point. James is a very inspiring guy. It's a great book. Great little stories. He's uh, he's had his share of uh, hurdles to uh, to overcome, and he's done it. And he continues to do it. And he helps other people. And that's really you know a big part of his story and how he's overcome his challenges is that he is of service to others, as he says. He does even uh, free lectures at certain uh, institutions, schools, things like that. And if you want to find him, let's plug that website one more time. JamesSwigert.com. That's J-A-M-E-S-S-W-E-I-G-E-R-T. And thanks for having me, Bob. Thanks, James. <laughs> let's go somewhere and go Woo-hoo! do something else. Okay. <laughs> Good Bye, night, everybody. everybody. <laughs> Much thanks for you guys listening in. Check out my website, TheExplodingHuman.com. And subscribe to my YouTube channel, The Exploding Human with Bob Nickman. Much appreciation if you would do that. And uh, once again, thank you, James Swaggart. Love you, man.